I think, I think, I honestly think we should do a church-wide fast because of lockdown. Can I get an amen? Come on now, all those sweets that we shouldn't have had. All those times we said we were going to wake up earlier to do a bit of push-ups and sit-ups that we never did. All those times we said we were going to put our running shoes on at 5 o'clock in the afternoon and run around the garden, which we didn't do. Is that just me speaking? I don't know, guys. I think I, I, you know what? I think the proof is in the pudding. I can, I can call it out on a few people that we got to fast together. Together, we're going to fast together. we got a spiritual fast and a physical fast in Jesus' name. Amen. No, we, we spiritually fast, obviously, and then we physically fast because... That's why I'm not wearing white. Are you guys blessed? Hey, it's been an amazing day in the house. I'm so grateful that we had three different locations. You know, I say it to the View City team and the Bloberg team, but I'm going to say it for a long time. I'm so grateful for what God is doing in the life of View Church. Come on. COVID-19, if you look at the statistics, churches were meant to cripple. But people looked at the statistics and took their eyes off our God. He grew his church. In a season where churches shouldn't have grown, we went from one to three in Jesus' name. Come on. Three locations where people can get reached. At Bloberg today, we had two new families come to church. Come on. You see, people are getting into the house in different locations. I'm telling you right now, the future of our church, the future of our nation is so bright. It's exciting. I can't wait. Let's carry on pushing through. Let's carry on trusting God. He's alive. He's with us. He's for our country. He's gone before us. He's prepared the way. But he's asking for us as a church to stand up and take ground. Invite our friends. Invite our family. Come on. There are empty seats. I know it's social distancing. But think about it. There's six services. Imagine in the future all of those services are full to the rafters because of what we believe in inviting our friends and family. Come on. Can we believe for our friends and family? Come on. Are we going to trust God for their salvations? I want to. My brother was at church. Anyway, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about it all night. I didn't have a lot of time. I'm so grateful. Hey, who's been joining our series, Christian Atheist? Hey, it's been absolutely amazing. Uh, the past uh, six messages that we've had in the morning and the evening have truly blessed me, but none more than last week's message. I mean, the theology was amazing. The truth was amazing. But there are a few messages that I know that when I am on my deathbed, I'm going to be able to remember and recite and the reason I'm going to be able to remember and recite last week's messages is because I will never look at human fat the same again. <laughs> if you don't know what I'm talking about, do yourself a favor. Listen to our lead pastor, Leanne's message from the morning. She gives some explicit details about human fat. I will never forget it. Ever, ever. I'll, I'll never forget it. And then Dieter shared some pretty explicit stories as well about some, some runny tummies. But you know what? I was sitting right over there and I said, Man, I've got the best story for this message, but I don't have the mic. And I can't go, hold on, Dita, I want to share my story because it just wouldn't be okay. But guess what? I got the mic. And I really feel like I want to share my story, okay? Can I share my story? Is that okay? Just add it to last week's message, and then we're going to move on to this week's message. But I have the privilege of leading our Zambia team, and I've been to Zambia many times. And I know God's protected me in Zambia. He's protected me from malaria because I pretty much stop, stop halfway when it comes to taking my malaria tablets. Don't tell my mom. And if you go to, if you go to Zambia, just make sure you finish your course. And, uh, you know, I, they say take hand sanitizer. I take hand sanitizer. I, don't, I never open the hand sanitizer. I never use it, so my hands are always dirty. And it's bad, I know. I'm the guides, forgive me. And uh, God's protected me. I've seen a lot of people drop, drop like flies because they get bad tummies. Are oh, you weak? Uh, clearly, you shouldn't wash your hands that much. Just embrace the dirt, embrace the germs. Anyway, about three years ago, uh, I've been stomach, bad stomach free from, from many trips. I woke up on the last morning when we were meant to pack up and go back to base camp. And uh, I woke up before the sun was up, and it's freezing in the morning in Zambia because you're on the floodplain, it's, it's crazy cold. And uh, something was wrong. And uh, there's no running water, it's long drops, right? It's just, I need you guys to understand what I'm dealing with over here. And um, it's dirty, it's cold, it's, the showers don't really work. And uh, I wake up with a bad stomach. And I go, okay, you know, maybe it's just, it's, gonna, it's like a one cycle, I'm going to be okay. Thank you, Jesus. I prayed for my body. Got up, did my thing. Went back to bed, woke up, and I had to go for round two. Now, I'm, got, I'm like feverish. I'm like sweating. 
It sucks. I'm like, you know, did you know when you like walk like this? <laughs> I'm telling you my story. It's a lot better than human fat, just throwing it out there. Anyway, so I go the second time. I'm like, Jesus, please, I take all the medicine I need to take. It's Valoid, I think, or whatever, just to make it like, doesn't work. Anyway, go the second time. I can't go to the long drop because I don't want to be disrespectful to anyone else who's going to use it when they wake up. I had to like go find this random secluded area. And I go back to the tent, wash my hands. I wash my hands, had to wash my hands because that would have freaked me out. Then went back to bed, woke up again, had to go the third time. But remember, it's still early. So thankfully, no one was awake. I could do my thing in peace until the fourth time. Now, on the fourth time, not only were the South Africans awake, but the locals were awake too. Now, you must understand, when you're in Zambia, you will stick out like a sore thumb. When I'm in Zambia, I really stick out like a sore thumb. <laughs> okay, I'm six foot nine, this white guy. Okay, so the fourth time, the local children were awake too. <laughs> Woo! Hey, listen, I've already spoken five minutes. I need to hurry up. Anyway, the fourth time, the local children are awake, and they go, what's that tall guy doing? The tall guy is walking like this with a bog roll. <laughs> I couldn't do anything. I had children staring at me. I just stood there like, please go away. Please go away. And it was for about 15 minutes. And you know when you got a bad stomach, it doesn't matter what, what position you stand in, you're screwed. <laughs> so I had to find like a, like a stone and throw it at them. Say, get the picture and go away. Needless to say, I lost a pair of underpants that trip. But people got saved. Amen. Amen. That's my story. That's my story. This week, we are speaking about trusting God to protect you when you go to Zambia so you got no bad tummies. But we're speaking about protecting God. Now, the statement for this week is, I believe in God. I love in God. But I don't trust Him with everything. God, I love you. I believe in you, but I can't trust you with everything. By a show of hands, you can be open and honest. I was very open and honest with you right now. We're the control freaks in the house. Come on, if you're a control freak, you can put your hand up. If you're sitting next to someone who should have put their hand up, you can put your hand up on their behalf. You can shame them, it's totally okay. You know, maybe you, you don't classify yourself as a control freak, but you're always the person who sits on the couch at 7 p.m. with the family who decides what TV program to watch. Or you're always the person who decides what restaurant to go to. Or you're always the person who decides what color the family is going to wear. If you do that, then you really are a control freak. But you get my drift. There's something, and there's an area that might be in our life that we might not even be aware of that we are super controlling in. Do you know who I think has the most trust out of anyone walking on planet Earth right now? Like they must have, they, they're wired differently. Driving instructors. Think about it. They're taking a fresh 18-year-old CJ in a car for the first time. <laughs> never driven. Onto the open roads. And making him drive from point A to point B. They don't freak out. They relax, they're calm, first gear, foot of the clutch, slowly on the petrol. Now you contrast a really trusting driving instructor to parents who teach their children how to drive. Who's ever had their parents teach them how to drive? It was the worst experience of my life. I was convinced that they didn't love me anymore. <laughs> Come on. I was going to show a video, but uh, there were some bad words, so I couldn't show it of this guy vlogging his parents in the car neck with him, teaching him how to drive. Driving instructors have got some serious trust. Parents, I don't know if they've got some, as much trust. So I don't blame them, to be fair. If I had to teach CJ how to drive, I'd probably freak out too. In fact, I'd be quite scared to teach Alistair how to drive, and he's got his driver's license. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> Man, I should have shown that photo when Alistair parked the other day, but that's okay. That's okay. I've got, got a picture that's going to come up on screen quickly. I thought it was quite funny. Not that wheel, Jesus, the steering wheel. <laughs> I saw that, that meme pop around quite a bit in, in COVID-19. I thought it was so funny. I thought it was hilarious. Not that wheel, Jesus, not that wheel. 
But how often do you and I go, Jesus, take the wheel of my life, but I'm going to put my hand on the wheel too. Or you go, Jesus, take the wheel of my life, but I want to show you which direction to drive the car. There are areas in our life where we struggle to trust Jesus in. There are, it could be finances. It could be the, your family's future. It could be for your health and safety. We're in a crazy season where I believe that this message is so applicable in. It could be your school life. It could be your friendships, your relationships. But there are areas where we go, Jesus, take the wheel, but I'm going to hold on to it too. And I thought that picture was amazing. Jesus, take the wheel, but I'm going to hold on to it too. It says in Psalm 77, verse 13 to 14, your ways, God, are holy. What God is as great as our God? You are the God who performs miracles. You display your power among the peoples. How often do we say, God, you are the King of kings. You are the Lord of lords. You are the leader of my life, but I'm still going to hold onto the steering wheel. Quick Bible facts. In the New Testament, there were 35 recorded miracles. In fact, John says that if they had to uh, write down and record all the works that Jesus did, it would just be crazy. There wasn't enough paper or ink. But they recorded 35. Out of those 35, there were 17 physical body miracles. Six of those were deliverances. Three of those were people being raised from the dead. And none of those were miracles in nature. We're going to focus on a miracle that happened in nature tonight and the lessons that we can learn in what Jesus taught his disciples. We're going to be reading a, a, a two passages of Scripture. We're going to start in Mark and we're going to end in Matthew. They're the same accounts, but they just give different details of the same story. Are we going to read it together? Is that okay? Are you guys with me? That's good. I hope you guys aren't thinking about the fourth time I went to the toilet, but focusing on God's truth. I know you weren't. I don't know why I said that. Anyway, let's go. Mark 4, verse 35 to 38. That day when the evening came, he said to his disciples, pay attention to this. Let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along, just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious swell came up and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? Matthew 8 verse 26 to 27 says, He replied, You of little faith, why are you so afraid? Then he got up and rebuked the winds and the waves and it was completely calm. The men were amazed. What kind of man is this? Even the winds and the waves obey him. Side note, at that point in the disciples' journey with Jesus, they had seen him perform miracles. Yet they were still amazed that he was able to have a command over the winds and the waves. So I ask you, how well do you know Jesus? How well do you know his grace and his power and his mercy and his blessings for you? But in that story, there's three storms that we see the disciples encounter. There's three storms. The first one is the physical storm. That's the obvious one. It's the one that they were being just battered and thrown around by the wind and the waves. And what does that mean for us? Well, right now we're facing a physical uh, storm in the form of COVID-19. That's a physical storm that we're facing as individuals, as families, as a nation. But let's think outside of COVID-19, physical storms could be financial pressure at home. It could be your business struggling. It could be relationships that are taking strain in your family. It, it could be struggling at school or worried about your future. Or it could be worrying about how you're going to get through the year financially and in college and how you're going to pay your fees. We all face physical storms. We all face physical storms. No one is exempt from physical storms. But what happens is when we're in the middle of a physical storm, we enter into the second storm, which is called the emotional storm. And all of a sudden, our emotions go everywhere. We become fearful. We become scared. We lose confidence. We become angry. 
Come on, we've seen some people get angry in the season of COVID-19. We've seen some people get fearful in the season of COVID-19. We've seen some people lose hope in the season of COVID-19. The disciples got emotional and said, Jesus, don't you even care about us? They had seen what Jesus had done in their life and for so many other people. Yet in a storm, they asked Jesus, do you even care about us? Do you even care about me? There's an emotional storm. There's an emotional storm that we're going to face. And the third storm, and this is the most dangerous storm, is we enter into a spiritual storm. Where we start to question whether Jesus is true. When we start to question his word, when we start to question his promises, when we start to question his presence, when we start to, to question just he's all powerful, he's all knowing, he's all understanding, we start to question who Jesus is in our life. The disciples entered into a spiritual storm in that moment. We can't control the physical storms that happen around us. I wish I could have controlled COVID-19. It would have been finished seven months ago. But I don't have control over COVID. I don't have control as to where your business is at the moment. I don't have control. You don't have control over the, the tensions and relationships or what's happening at school. You don't have control. But what we can control is how we respond to an emotional storm and a spiritual storm. Because that's how you respond to the physical storm. We've got to choose how we respond. Are we going to trust Jesus with everything? Are we going to say, Jesus, I believe in you, I love you, and I trust you with everything? That's the decision we make in the emotional and the spiritual storm. It says in Hebrews 6 verse 19, And we have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain. We have to anchor our trust in Jesus. We tie it to ourselves. If you can imagine there's a rope around my waist or your waist, and if you throw the anchor in, its purpose is to catch onto a rock that is immovable, and it's going to hold you there. When you put your full trust into Jesus, it is going nowhere. It's a solid rock. It's a firm rock. It's a strong foundation. So I'm asking you, and listen, I struggle with it too, and I'm going to get into it in just a bit. I don't think anyone will ever be perfect at this, but we can keep getting 1% better every day and saying, I'm going to carry on trusting you with everything, with my future, my finances, my family, my family who aren't saved, my business. I'm going to keep trusting you with everything. I'm going to take my hand off the steering wheel and I'm going to let you drive. I'm going to let you lead my life. So if you're taking notes, which I hope you are, the first thing to build trust is we have to cultivate God's presence every day. We've got to cultivate the presence of God every day to build trust. It says in Psalm 91, verse 1 to 4, Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge, my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely He will save you from the foulest snare and the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. Then it goes on to say in Psalm 100, verse 1 to 5, Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us. We are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all the generations. At the back end of Psalm 100, when we do this, we remind ourselves of those three things. That the Lord is good. His love endures forever. And we are reminded of his faithfulness that has continued through all the generations. God's a consistent God. God's a God of eternity. He wasn't just faithful to that generation 
or to your parents' generation, he's faithful to this generation now, and he's going to be faithful to the next generation. Are you reminding yourself of the goodness of God as you enter into his presence, as you cultivate his presence, as you get into it through worship and praise and prayer, where you remind that I can put my trust for my family. I can put my trust in God for my business, for the future, for my family's future in this country. We cultivate it through the presence of God. I'm going to be open and honest with you. There were days in lockdown where I struggled personally. Got a bit anxious, started to overthink, but I knew what my weapon was in that moment. I got into worship. I entered into worship. I took my phone out and I put on worship songs. And I sat in his presence and I was reminded of the goodness of God. And I believe he brought a peace onto my life over the situations and the, the areas that I was struggling in. So I want to encourage you, if there are areas in your life that you are struggling to trust God in, enter into worship and give those things to God. Put it at the foot of the cross. He is bigger than those areas. We need to put our trust in our Father. The second thing that I want to, actually, you know what, before I go on, as a church, Martin put a, a worship playlist together, which I have in my phone, and I open that playlist all the time. As far as I'm aware, it's on Apple and Spotify, correct? It's my team here. So it's on Apple and Spotify. Just search View Church and the playlist is there. It's all the songs we're doing. So there's no excuse. There's a playlist that we set up for you. If you don't know how to get into worship, put that playlist on, sit down, and just enter in. We've got you sorted. The second thing is to build trust, we have to remember God's promises every single day. There are a lot of things happening on social media. You can go on to social media and you can get the world news in just a second. You can see what's happening in our country. You can see what's happening in Zimbabwe at the moment. You can see what's happening in Nigeria. And these are all good things to know that's happening. But if that's all you're focusing on, you're going to struggle to see a future for yourself in this country. You're going to struggle to see a future for your business in this country. You're going to struggle to see why should I just carry on doing what I'm doing if this is all I'm seeing. If you look at the news, if you are on social media, I want to encourage you, if you spend 30 minutes on social media, spend an hour in God's Word. The Word of God brings life. You can watch as much social media as you want. It's not going to breathe life into you. In fact, it's probably going to make you extremely fearful. It's going to make you extremely sad. It's probably going to stop you from trusting God fully in every area of your life. But I know that my God is for this country. I know that my God's got a future for this country. I know that my God's got a future for my future family in this country, for the church in this country, for leaders who are being raised up in the next generation who are going to lead our country. Because I'm reminding myself of God's promises. You know what? A few weeks ago, as a family, we found out that my mom's sister was diagnosed with breast cancer, which is crazy. But not only was she diagnosed with breast cancer, in the process of being diagnosed, she contracted COVID-19. And they had to perform a surgery on her that they couldn't because they had, she had to wait for a, a time period for COVID to get out of her system. So essentially what could have been happening is the cancer could have been growing in the space that they couldn't cut it out. And in that moment, I either had to make a decision to say, God, I don't trust you for the situation. This is crazy. How's my family going to think about this? How's my auntie going to move forward? Or I had to make the decision and go, I know who my God is. I know that my God is the miracle worker. I know that my God is our healer. I know that he can heal her in an instant. Am I going to put my faith and trust in him to perform a miracle over her life? I want to encourage you. You can be super discouraged by the news, but be encouraged by knowing who you serve and who you belong to. I knew who my God was in that situation. I knew that he could heal her, and I know that he will heal her in Jesus' name. We build trust by reminding ourselves of God's promises every single day. Number three, and I'm gonna ask Brendan to come up on stage. We build trust when we understand God's process. 
we build trust when we understand God's process. Now, I don't know if you remember, I said pay attention to that scripture. Jesus said this before they entered into the boat. Let us go over to the other side. He spoke that to his disciples. But there was a process to get from point A to point B. The disciples forgot the process. And because they forgot the process, they stopped trusting Jesus. They lost their faith. They got scared. They got fearful. They questioned who Jesus was. They even said, hey, who is this man? We go through storms. We go through seasons where we have to trust the process of God. You see, it's all, we can say, well, why doesn't God just tell us what the process is? If the disciples knew the process that they had to go through in order to learn the lessons that they were going to learn, they would never have learned those lessons they were taught in the boat. If they knew that Jesus was going to tell the wind and the waves to calm down, they would never have been fearful. The disciples learned a lesson. The crazy thing is Jesus spoke to the disciples before he spoke to the storm. Sometimes we have to go through some storms because God wants to teach us something. Chris Hodges says this, that the storm might not build your character, but it's certainly going to reveal it. We always say, oh, it's character building. Well, actually, it's character revealing. The disciples' character was revealed in the storm. Their trust was revealed in the storm. You see, sometimes we have to go through some things in order for those areas that we're struggling to be revealed. And when they're revealed, we're able to work on them. Maybe it's finances. Trust God with your finances. Maybe it's relationships in your family. Maybe it's school. I don't know what it is. But if you're going through a storm, trust the process. Because in the process, there's a lesson. In the process, you're going to become stronger and stronger and stronger. Trust the process. It says in Romans 5, verse 2 to 4, Through whom we gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. If you allow God to get you through the storm, if you can trust God fully, not only will you get through it, but you'll get through it stronger. You'll get through it even more equipped. You'll get through it even more ready for the next season. We can't control the physical storms, but we can control our emotions and our spiritual storms. We can give our complete trust to Jesus. Because we're going to face some things. I want all of us to wake up every morning and go, God, I believe in you, I love you, and I trust you with everything. Let's make a decision to get 1% better every single day in the area of trust. We build trust by cultivating the presence of God. We build trust by remembering His promises. And we build trust by understanding that God has got a process. You know what's encouraging for me? Is that our country is going through a process in COVID-19. A process where I genuinely believe we're going to get stronger because of it. Where the future of this country has become even more bright. Because God is doing something new in this nation. Churches are standing up. You know that in the beginning of lockdown, there were record, record number of salvations being captured in churches around the world. Why? Because people were able to receive the gospel in front of a TV. We don't know how many people have heard the good news in this COVID-19 season. Maybe there was a process involved. Maybe there was a, a method to the madness. Maybe we're going to see people and family members who we thought would never be saved in the house of God, serving Him, shining His light. Because the only way we can confidently stand here and say that the future of this country is bright is that the church of Jesus shines brighter week in and week out. As the church grows, as the church takes ground, more people have the fear of God in their life, doing what God has asked them to do. Let's trust God for our nation. 
Let's trust God for our family. Let's trust God for ourselves as individuals in every area. Can I ask that you close your eyes? I'm so grateful that we can, we can worship our God, that we can serve our God. And maybe you're sitting here tonight and you've never made a decision to let Jesus actually take the steering wheel. Maybe you know you're at a point where you can no longer drive your life, that you can no longer be the leader of your own life. You know that you need Jesus to take the wheel. You know you need to put your trust in Jesus in every area. If that's you, everyone's eyes are closed. We wanna pray with you tonight, together as a family. If you wanna make the decision to say, Jesus, take the wheel on the count of three, I wanna encourage you to put your hand up. No one is looking. This moment is between you and Jesus. If you wanna make that decision, the best decision ever, to make Jesus your Lord and Savior. On three, I wanna put you, I wanna ask you to put your hand up. One, Jesus gave it all for you. Two, so when you accept Him, you're promised eternity. He will lead your life. Three, if that's you, do you wanna put your hand up? We've got a hand at the back, thank you. We've got a hand over there. There's another hand at the back over there, thank you, Jesus. If you know that you want Jesus to be the leader of your life, the Savior of your life, I wanna encourage you to put your hand up. There's the hand over here. We're gonna pray together. And let's pray it like we mean it. Jesus, come on, that's like five of us. Jesus, thank you for giving your life for me. I declare that you are my Lord and you are my Savior. From this day onwards, I want you to take the wheel. I want you to be the leader of my life as I live my life for you. I pray that you keep me, that you guide me, that you show me your ways as I commit my life in Jesus' name, amen.